welcome to Literary Prospects, where we talk to authors and other literary professionals about books, publishing, and the writing life. I'm Kelly Vick, the host of the program, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest, author Taylor Brown. Taylor Brown grew up on the Georgia coast. He was named the 2021 Georgia Author of the Year, is the recipient of a Montana Prize in Fiction, and a three-time finalist for the Southern Book Prize. He's the author of the short story collection In the Season of Blood and Gold, as well as five novels, Fallen Land, The River of Kings, Gods of Howl Mountain, Pride of Eden, and his latest, Wing Walkers. Taylor lives in Savannah, Georgia, where he is the founder and editor-in-chief of Bikebound, one of the world's leading custom motorcycle publications. So let's get started. Taylor Brown, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on and congratulations on this beautiful novel, your fifth. You were a critically acclaimed author already. Um, and this book is receiving even more very well-deserved critical acclaim. I'll go through uh, just a little bit. Publishers Weekly says, Brown crafts a heart pounding plot and his gorgeous descriptions of Southern terrain from the air resonate just as much. The result is both elegant and thrilling. Author Paula McLean says Brown's vision is as fresh and audacious as his language, gutsy, original, and powerfully imagined. And author Ron Rash says you are clearly one of the best American writers of your generation. So with that, um, tell us a little bit about Wing Walkers, your, your latest novel. So Wing Walkers for me really started, interestingly enough, on my first ever book tour. It was 2016. I was on book tour for Fallen Land, and I was in Oxford, Mississippi. And in Oxford is Square Books, which is one of the most really neat story bookstores, I'd say in the whole country, not just the South. And the walls are covered in all of this literary mem memorabilia both people who have visited and lots of historical photographs and stuff like that. And I, I was on the staircase landing and I was just kind of having fun, checking out the, checking out the walls, spending my, most of my day in there. And I saw the shadow box on the wall that had a picture of Faulkner in it, but it was not the Faulkner that we're used to seeing with the pipe and gray hair and looks like someone who won the Nobel prize. Right. Uh -huh. This was, um, <laughs> He was, he looked like he was just out of his teens and he was in a uniform, Royal Aircraft, uh, um, RAF Royal Air Force uniform and he had his cane his rattan cane and his hat cocked on all bold and there was a set of flying wings in in the box and a striped regimental tie and a sketch of a World War One biplane which I later came to find out was done in Faulkner's hand and it immediately gigged my imagination because one I was already a Faulkner fan since college and I remembered that a lot of his early work had aviation in it which we don't talk about as much but was a really big inspiration for him and I grew up loving airplanes. My dad was a pilot. I was what um, I sometimes have heard called a waffle belly. The idea being that you, someone like a kid who goes to the airport and just to watch the airplanes, you know, at the fence, uh, take off and land. And if you do it long enough, you know. Oh, the, you get the waffle. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm from so, Georgia and I grew up hanging out at airports too. My dad's a No pilot. way. Yeah. Where Georgia are you from? I'm from just, from Lithia Springs, if you know okay. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to, and so I spent many a weekend out at West Georgia Regional Airport out by oh, Carrollton. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, oh. flying around in my dad's champ. So. Uh, well, no way. Your dad <laughs> yeah. was a pilot too. So you know all about this then. So yes, dad, you know, I just grew up around that. I loved it. We would go to the airport just to go watch the airplanes. Just to go. It was really a thing to just go look at the airplanes. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. That was like one of our things that we would do. So, anyways, you take together that aviation. Uh, interest and the interest in Faulkner and I just had to know more so I dug up some biographies and memoirs about him and soon came to find out what a big part of his life it was um, from the time he was a kid building model airplanes to trying to join the RAF to having his own barnstorming troop later that he set up with uh, one of his brothers and in his uh, in the Blotner biography which is like the big three volume definitive Faulkner biography in chapter 36, I found this little tidbit that really is where the, the whole book took flight. And in 1934, Faulkner went to the opening of the Shushan Airport in New Orleans, which is now the Lakefront Airport. If anyone goes to New Orleans, go visit. There's a restaurant there. It's this Art Deco masterpiece. It's beautiful. In 1934, it opened during Mardi Gras. 
they thought it was going to be the new air hub of the Americas. So they did this huge to do. I mean, you know, Rex's, the big crew there, their theme for Mardi Gras was conquest of the air and they had air races and barnstorming and all this stuff. And in his biography, it says that Faulkner didn't come home one night while he was there. He showed up the next morning, hung over and over breakfast, he told this wild tale of the night he'd spent hanging out with two, with a man and a woman who are motorcyclists slash aviators in the meet. <laughs> don't know anything about the meat of that story who they were or how their lives intersected with Faulkner's or what that night was like and in all my research I couldn't find out anything else which I was glad about in some ways because then I could reimagine who those characters were and how their lives intersected with Faulkner's in at Mardi Gras 1934 um, so that really is where the book came about um, and it follows those two characters are Della the Daring and her husband, uh, Zeno Marigold, Della's a wing walker. Zeno is a um, former World War I ace uh, who turned to barnstorming after the war. And they've really been going around the South, just kind of literally living on a wing in a prayer, performing these <laughs> death defying stunts for, you know, the pennies of farmhands and factory workers and whatnot. And uh, in the book, they've decided they're going to make their way west to Hollywood because all these big aerial epics are being made. Howard Hughes is making Hell's Angels and uh, Howard Hawks has made Dawn Patrol and they're remaking it soon. And uh, so they're coaxing their dilapidated Jenny biplane across Great Depression America. And as they're kind of going west, um, Faulkner's kind of coming up in the world until their lives intersect. So that's kind of the the way the storylines work. It's you know? so exciting. Um, I'm always fascinated by historical fiction, particularly because it's, it's so difficult to get it right. It's hard enough when you can look out your window and, and get it right, you know, yeah. but you're looking back, you can't observe it in your daily life. So um, how, how does your research work? How do you research this? And particularly, I guess, you know, as you've mentioned, there's a lot of information on Faulkner, but, um, you know, these aeronauts and wing walkers, how do you, what kind of research did you do for for that. I was able to find a good bit about aviation is one of those things that has been pretty well. There have been a lot of books about it. There's a pretty good amount of history and there were a lot of photographs taken luckily. So mm -hmm. that really helped. Um, I don't think I have it right here, but I actually grew up with a book in our house. We had this um, set of time life books about like the epic of flight. It was about the history of flight and one was called Wing Walkers and Speed Kings. And I remember looking at that book when I was probably five or six years old and I tracked down another copy when I was working on this book to see, and it had all these old black and white photographs, a lot of information about the barnstorming era, which really started after World War I. You had a lot of pilots who came home from World War I. You could buy a war surplus, sur surplus army biplane for $500. And they took to the barnstorming and traveling around the country and, and doing this kind of thing. And you know, this is before YouTube and TV and <laughs> watching stuff on Amazon Prime and all this daredevil stuff was really popular at the time from the 20s all the way up through the Great Depression um, when it was it was cheap it was cheap entertainment for people um and so I did a bunch of reading on that luckily I'd grown up around airplanes uh, so that helped with a lot of the mechanics of it I was able to ju just dig up fun stuff like old books like uh aviation Lauren Faulkner you know books that are out of print just kind of weird esoteric academic books that are out there where did you find um, them I like usually usually used from like a books and stuff like that mm -hmm. sometimes I could get them you know you can find them at the library but I like to have a book that I you know put notes in and can refer back to so yeah. I was usually trying to get one but a friend wanted that aviation Lauren Faulkner this past week was curious about it and I looked it up and it was 117 dollars for a hardback and $55 wow. for a soft cover if you could find one. The only ones I could find, you know, mine, luckily it wasn't that expensive when I got it. <laughs> but, so digging stuff up, something that really may help other fiction writers is that there were also, if you're, it's the right era, and this was during the Great Depression, the WPA hired all of these journal, journalists and authors um, to write basically travel guides of different areas. So there's like a WPA guide written during the Great Depression era about Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, a bunch of these. And they have a, all this information about what it was like at those times. So sometimes when they stop somewhere, somewhere I found 
in like an, a 1930s WPA guide to Mississippi or something. It wow. was an interesting place, like some salt baths, right? Or um, some kind of like big uh, rock quarry or clay quarry or things like that, that I knew were there from a little bit. Of, that would point me in the right direction. And then I could go down the rabbit hole. So I'm like, oh, this is interesting. You know, Seely's Hot Springs, right? Like mm-hmm. what's the story on this and find old photographs and I can make that a whole setting and scene, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And that's such a good tip. Did you, um, did you do a lot of traveling too? I mean, did you actually get, go to these places? I guess it doesn't look the same, obviously. Yeah. So I, don't... I did a lot. The, the, bu- the bulk of the book takes place along the Mississippi Gulf Coast and mm-hmm. they're flying for part of it and not to give too much of a spoiler, but the airplane breaks down and they have to uh, borrow someone's motorcycle. <laughs> and I have a, um, I have a bunch of family and friends in New Orleans. So that's a trip that I make a lot and I have made it on my motorcycle multiple times. And so what I would do is take these back roads that they would have been taking then. Obviously this is before they're traveling before the interstates were built before, you know, interstate 10 or anything Mm -hmm. like that. So um, absolutely. I would basically, I've taken the same uh, multiple times, basically around the same route that they took when they were on the ground and then been on the ground during the routes that they're flying over, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then it does help with, you know, you got Google uh, satellite now, so you can look at things from the top down, makes mm-hmm. it easier to see what things look like, you know, from the air, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was some of that, although the world, so it's fun to imagine how different it was back then, you know, how much things have developed, you know, especially the coast, you know, the Florida, oh, yeah. coast, the Mississippi coast and those things. Speaking of from the air, did you do, you travel by motorcycle? You said, did you do any flying over to get? Didn't do too much flying over. I would have if, um, honestly, my old man was still around when I, he was when I started writing this book and I would have probably gotten to do that with him. And that was in my head when I started working on this book that I thought that at some point, absolutely, we would fly the course that they take in the book, right? Mm -hmm. That would be some Mm -hmm. kind of little vacation that we took. Um, and unfortunately he passed away in 2017. So we never quite got to do that. Um, but I do have dreams of getting my pilot's license and, you know, one of the goals would be to do kind of to do the wing walkers trip myself flying, you know, Oh, that would be great. And you did dedicate the book to your dad, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is pretty special. Um, you, you use two points of view in, in this book, one from the young Faulkner and the other is Della, the the wing walker. How, um, and it sort of pivots back and forth between those two. Um, how do you choose, how do you choose which points of view uh, you wanted to tell the story from and, you know, how you, how many and how you wanted to do that? I wanted to keep this one uh, fairly simple if I could, because my mm-hmm. other book that I was working on at the same time, kind of going back and forth with Pride of Eden has a few more viewpoints. So I wanted to keep this one down to a couple if I could. Um, and then it's really which one spoke strongest to me. Um, Della was just, is just a very strong character. She's really interesting. She's um, one of those characters that stand up and, and just, they act for you. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it almost feels like you are riding their coattails a little bit if that makes Mm -hmm. sense Mm -hmm. and then Faulkner I was absolutely fascinated in trying to get inside his mind a little bit both from the perspective of I was interested in books like you know Paula McLean um, was was, is a friend and she um, now and she blurbed the book and she had written the the Paris Wife which had Hemingway in it you know largely from Hadley's Mm -hmm. perspective but um, it that was the first book that I read that really made me interested in getting into the more the life of a literary character Mm -hmm. uh, or a real literary figure but making them a character um and Faulkner is one of the authors that's closest to my heart and I feel like I had some affinities with him with um with the flying with um you know they're just even just small things you know he wasn't he wasn't really tall he wasn't somebody of big stature and that was sometimes an issue for him and I'm not the biggest uh in terms of height you know they're just little things and then you know when you read it although we think of a of a literary figure like Faulkner as being very successful he wasn't successful during much of his life right you know and his own family and own hometown didn't always take his work seriously probably the majority of his life didn't take his life his work very seriously so 
he had lots of financial woes and all this kind of thing, um, critical issues. And so it makes you feel closer to a character like that when you get into their challenges, right? And that mm -hmm. you can some, uh, you know, being an author is, is not an easy game, you know, it's not, <laughs> a, it's not, a, we don't do it because it's, it makes for an easy life necessarily, right? So um, that helped me feel, you know, closer to him. And so I felt like I really established this kind of kinship as time went on. Um, so I really wanted, I was really interested in telling it partly from his perspective. And so it was really Della and Faulkner were the two points of view that just spoke strongest to me. Mm -hmm. And it works out really well. I also sort of like that you had the, the masculine and feminine, mm -hmm. if you will. Zeno is an awesome character too, but it just kind of felt like if it was Faulkner and Z you know, that would be a yeah, little- Yeah, that would be too, yeah. I totally a little agree. testosterone heavy. I don't yeah. <laughs> it has the yin and the yang or something. Right. I know it's balanced a little more. Yeah, it would be too much. Right. It, it, it worked out really beautifully. Um, your previous book, you you mentioned Pride of Eden, uh, came out in, in March of 2020. So um, I expect that that ended up being a very different kind of book release. <laughs> it was. It was, um, it was an adventure, not, not my favorite of my adventures, I would say, but uh, it came out March, 2020. We had the whole book. We didn't, you know, things were just from day to day back then. Things were changing. CDC was saying something different. We ha had a whole book tour plan and it came out on, you know, it comes out on Tuesday as books do. And that Monday, I mean, I was packed up. I was here in my office, ready to go, bags packed. And CDC came out that morning and said, you know, no groups over, I forget how many, what the number was at the time, but we just decided that if we just were going to, you know, cancel everything. So then we all were kind of scrambling to go online um, and do the Zoom stuff, but, you know, no one really knew how to work Zoom yet. <laughs> um, and it was buggy back then because everyone was trying to use it and the bandwidth and all that. <laughs> but it was a crazy time because the same week, so Pride of Eden is set on basically a big cat sanctuary, mm -hmm. right? And it came out the same week that Tiger King came out. Um, <laughs> I had no idea that Tiger King, I knew about, um, I knew about him. I knew about that story from my own research into the book, but I had no idea that it was going to become the mainstream cultural phenomenon that it did. Um, and uh Pride of Eden tells a much different story. I mean, it's about people that are really doing good work for the mm -hmm. most part, you know, in trying to take care of these animals, not exploit them. You know, it's at a place that doesn't let people come visit. And when it does, it's kind of begrudgingly so, you know, um, mm -hmm. and the main characters are sometimes taking animals out of bad situations, uh, taking the idea of rescue, of wildlife rescue quite literally, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, not always following the letter of the law, so to speak. Um, to, to basically rescuing some animals out of bad situations and taking care of them. Um, so anyways, but it made this wild thing that all of a sudden I've got a book out that's really about a big cat sanctuary. And I know how to talk about all, all of this. I've done tons of research, been to all these sanctuaries, talked to all these people, and then Tiger King came out at the same time. So that kind of made up for a little bit of it because it just was exciting to talk about. It just made people that much more exciting, excited about the book, I think, you know, but um, anyways, yeah, so it was, it was wild. Are you excited to get back out on the road for this one? I assume you are. I am really excited. <laughs> I am. I'm, I, you know, I'm not the biggest extrovert, but I, I do love getting out there and seeing both readers in person, booksellers. I mean, I've done this enough now that uh, there's a lot of booksellers that I call my friends that, mm -hmm. um, I haven't gotten to see for, see for a couple of years, you know? And so I'm really excited about it. I'm excited to get back out there. And it's just, it, it fills up your well, you know? Sometimes mm -hmm. writing can be such a isolating thing. You know, we feel like we're so, um, you know, you're just in a room by yourself working on it. And and for long stretches, I'm totally fine with that. That's how I'm built. But it is nice every once in a while to get out there and be like, hey, people read this stuff, you know, people <laughs> enjoy it, you know? And just talk to other people about it, you know? Um, I mean, most, a lot of people that in my daily life don't have any idea, I think that, you know, what I do exactly or, you know, to the level that I do it or how much I'm into it, you know? So it's kind of fun when you get out into the world and, and talk to some people that do, you know? Yeah. How do you, that's, that's an interesting question in a, in a good um, topic. How do you make writer friends? You obviously have a lot of writer friends 
now oh. from having published five novels and whatnot. But yeah, how do you get that? The community, as you're saying, is so important. How do you? Yeah, um, I think that what's been huge is a lot of the festivals and conferences, mm -hmm. which I've been um, lucky that my publisher, you know, was supportive of sending me to, especially early on. So you know, Southern Book Independent Booksellers Alliance, uh, Louisiana Book Festival, Mississippi Book Festival, Decatur Book Festival. Excuse me, I just did the Savannah Book Festival um, in February. It's my first time doing it. And it was the first festival I've been able to do since 2020. Wow. And I was just talking to some other authors. I was like, wow, y'all. I mean, I miss this so much because you can just, even if you're just commiserating about, you know, <laughs> I mean, sometimes you just need someone to vent to, to be honest. I mean, that sounds bad, but someone that understands mm -hmm. or that just, uh, you know, what we do is not that common. So there aren't that many people to talk to about it. And the last couple of years have been tough because it's not really the same to just email folks. I'm not, I don't talk on the phone a whole lot. A lot of, you know, folks in my generation tend not to, it seems. So, mm -hmm. um, it's really an in-person thing where you make those connections, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like it's easy to make writer friends at these things because writers are like, oh, another writer, you know, <laughs> someone else that does this because usually in your own hometown, you might know almost no one, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I moved from Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a strange town because it has, you throw a rock and you hit and a very talented author, right? I mean, mm -hmm. every Jason Mott, who won the National Book Award lives there, Wiley Cash, um, you know, a friend of mine, Peter McGuire, um, you know, uh, Nina de Gramont, who wrote the uh, Christie Affair. I mean, th th there are a zillion people there. So that was really nice. And we moved to Savannah, which is an awesome arts and literary town, which is really supportive. But there aren't mm -hmm. quite as many um, authors here that I've met. Plus mm -hmm. with COVID, you know, all the events were, weren't ha taking place as much and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, yeah. It's, um, I guess, I, you know, we know that Faulkner is obviously one of your big literary influences. Can you talk about uh, who else there is that you would consider an influence on your work? Sure. Um, I think that probably the most formative ones for me were the modernists around Faulkner, you know, Faulkner, Virginia Woolf, uh, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, that whole era probably was really formative for me. I grew up just pulling books off the shelves and, and reading everything that was in our house, which was not really high literature necessarily. You know, a lot of things more like um, mysteries and thrillers and, and that kind of thing, which I think just reading is good. Mm -hmm. Although I, I had a sister who was seven years older. And so a lot of her school books were on the shelves. So I would pull some of those down, you know, not always good when you're, you know, like, reading Truman Capote's Cold Blood, you know, in Cold Blood, <laughs> you're like nine or something. You know? but, um, just because you find it on the shelf, right? Um, yeah. Or like Cormac McCarthy or something, you know, when you're like, when you're like 10 years old. But, um, uh, but I think that the modernists were probably the most and continue to be some of the most influential for me just because I read them at, at a time when I think I was very impressionable in some ways. They helped to shape me. And so they're kind of foundational um, to some degree. Um, and then, honestly, I really like a lot of the, um, especially in latter years, I got more into, you know, like Raymond Chandler and a lot of noir stuff. And mm -hmm. I think that sometimes I gravitate toward, I wish that I could just read for fun like I used to. And I have a harder time if it's fiction doing that. A lot of the time I'm reading it, but I'm also studying it, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I felt like I, I was reading a lot of the noir stuff because the plots, how the plots move, and they tend to have really great dialogue. You know, this kind of snappy Elmore Leonard type of dialogue mm -hmm. that keeps things moving. And so it's kind of finding what I feel a, a direction I feel like I need to improve or want to grow in and then reading something from that, um, a master of that, of whatever mm -hmm. that is. Does that make sense? Yes, it totally makes sense. Um, and so I feel like that's what I've probably done more in recent years. Um, and, and, and I'll do that in little chunks, you know, I'll read a few books in this direction or in that direction, stuff like that. Did you always know you wanted to be a writer? I knew pretty early on. I was one of those folks that knew early on. I was always a storyteller. I mean, we have this joke in my house that, you know, I tell that 
I would, I would just chase my mom around the house telling her stories, you know, about <laughs> why my GI Joes were the size they were and why my Triceratops had rocket launchers and wings. And she would literally go lock herself in the laundry room or the bathroom sometimes to get some work done I would sit down on the floor. And I would turn my head and I would just keep talking, telling her stories underneath the door. Right. <laughs> and, um, and now if I'm really working on something and I'm home and, or here, you know, with my partner, AJ, I will follow her around the house. <laughs> I realize telling her about it, you know, so things don't change that much. And then I had like a lot of people, I had a few, I had three big teachers along the way that, that really put me on the path or kept me on the path. In first grade, there was a teacher named Mrs. Pruitt. I don't know what anybody else, what you're supposed to do in first grade or what anyone else does in first grade. But as I remember, we wrote and illustrated a story every single day. That's what I remember from first grade. And we had these newsprint sheets and the bottom half was line where you could, you could uh, we were learning cursive and you could, um, uh, or not cursive, but, but it's up, uppercase and lowercase. So that, mm-hmm. like one line was for when you do uppercase because we're still learning all that. And then the top was blank and you um, illustrated it. And I just, rec- I recall what seems like hundreds of those. And we have a few of them still around. Um, and I do think that that helps me feel like it's such a daily practice because that started young and it probably helped less with having um, writer's block. Cause when you're like overcoming a blank page every single day, you mm-hmm. know, that probably is good training. Um, so that really started there. And I wrote a story about this spider that steals a remote control car on Christmas. <laughs> and um, it ended up like winning the school contest and then this county contest and it went off the state and I never heard about it. But I did kind of feel like, oh, maybe I have a knack for this. And then in high school, I had uh, Mrs. Kaysen, who was my AP English teacher, who started just giving me books that weren't really on the syllabus, but I had such an appetite. She was coming up with books. She thought that I would like. So she was kind of feeding them to me um, a little bit on the side. And um, then in college, I had uh, a professor, Dr. McAlexander, who's the other um, person who's the book is dedicated to. And he taught American modernism. That was the first time I had his class. And then he taught Faulkner. And he was just, he's, he's still around. He is a character. He's from <laughs> Holly Springs, Mississippi. There's some story, there's something like he dated at one time Faulkner's niece or something like, something like that. You know, he's, he's in his eighties. I, you know, I grew up in Georgia as you did, but when I, I, I went to the university of Georgia and that first day he walked in the class, I had no idea of what he was saying. His accent was so thick. Was <laughs> that I, I didn't even know. It took me a week to figure out what he was saying. <laughs> wow. That's um, an accent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, th- and you know, he would wear like the whole thing, like after, I forget what the, the rules are, but after Labor Day or whatever, he would wear seersucker and then <laughs> after memor- whatever it was, you know, and then he would go back to his blue, his blue blazer, right? Yeah. <laughs> strict on these rules like that. And come in and um, I, I realized later that he, the way he conducted a classroom was like how I, I had no idea then, and I'm not sure he knows but it's like a Zen master conducts things. It's almost like what a Zen master will do is try to catch someone off guard so that they will reply with something that comes with almost without thought, more with not so much instinct, but without any kind of um, pretense, right? Mm -hmm. Without any kind of contrivance. And Dr. McAlexander would do the same thing. He would call, he'd put you on the spot, you know? And it was, I mean, it was scary as hell at first. But Sounds terrifying. Happened, it was <laughs> terrifying. And it would scare out a third of the class would leave the first week, right? Because they just weren't up for it. But if you stuck around, magic would happen in that classroom because somehow he would get people going and you would say things that you had no idea how that just came out of you. And then someone else would do it. And it would just go around the room like I remember it was like lightning crackling around. And he would be pulling it out. He'd be like, yeah. Yes. You know, and he's all gesticulating and, you know, he had all these kind of very engaged with everyone. And I remember it was a big deal to me because um, at first he called me Brownie. And um, then we were reading Great Gatsby and he called on me and it was the first time I kind of spat out something, you know, in paragraph form that I had no idea. I was like, wow, did I just say that? And I guess he was impressed because he was like, yes, yes. He's like, from now on, you're no longer Browning, you're Browning. 
I was like, oh, that feels, uh, you know, that was kind of a proud moment uh, as like a sophomore at the University of Georgia, you know, um, but he really kept me on that path too. And that's where I probably really um, learned a lot about Faulkner and read most of Faulkner's work and, and became a fan. What, what was your, so from there, from that study and that intense study at, at UGA, what was your road to, to, to actually becoming a published author like? How did you first get published? Yeah, not, not a straight path, I would say. <laughs> not a, it wasn't that easy. So I, I thought when I was in college, I was an English major, and I thought that I was maybe going to go into academia and you know, pursue a PhD and, and, and be an, an academic in, in, uh, in an English department somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I started working on fiction um, my senior year without, I hadn't taken any creative writing classes. I just started working on some short stories. And after I graduated that summer, when I was kind of figuring out what I was, what my next step was, what I was going to do. And I was studying for the uh, GRE to um, go to graduate school. I started working on my first novel, not my first published novel, Fallen Land, <laughs> a few novels before that, you know, that will never see the light of day, but you know, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> and um, so I was trying, I'd read, this sounds overly impulsive and romantic, but it worked out. So I had read uh, A Movable Feast, you know, Hemingway's memoir about 1920s Paris. And I was thinking, you know, this is the time I can go live somewhere abroad and um, it's going to be harder the older I get. And where can I go in the world now that I can live cheaply, that people are into culture and it'll be easy to make friends, but I can kind of scrape by and keep working on this book. And so I sold my car and I moved to Buenos Aires. Wow. And, um, <laughs> and I didn't have that much Spanish. I'd taken one semester of Spanish in college and I'd taken it in high school, you know, at a public high school in, in Georgia, mm -hmm. in South Georgia. So I was not, uh, certainly not <laughs> even close to conversational, but I went down there to teach English as a second language. And to be honest, what I was looking for, it worked out. Like I made all these friends. I was able to survive without um, having a lot of money and I was able to, you know, use some of those savings I got from selling my car and other savings I'd built up, you know, j just from regular jobs and stuff. And then, uh, and work on this, this novel and write the bulk of that first novel while I was down there. Then I moved, uh, to San Francisco to take a job out there. Um, my sister had moved out there kind of during the dot-com era. So I had, you know, a, an anchor out there, someone that, that was living out there from my family that already knew some people and stuff. I had somebody's couch to crash on. Um, and I stayed out there for a few years and I really just, I wrote what I call in the margins, you know, before work, during lunches, sometimes, uh, after work on the weekends, just when I could, um, both short stories, sending those out, trying to get those published and then working on, um, both that first novel I'd work on and then a, starting a second one. And, um, and I just tried to keep the stories out there, you know, and I think it took three or four years before I got a, a story published of me working at it. You know, it was a really big deal to me when I got a story published. It was a story called Black Swan in, it was in the Dead Mule School of Southern Literature, which was a North Carolina state subsidized um, literary journal that I think is still around. I haven't uh, checked in a while. And then I uh, just kept on trying to get the stories out there and uh, I got a story of mine, you know, I started to get more published and a story of mine won the Montana Prize in Fiction, which brought a little bit of interest from an agent um, who said, do you have a novel? And so I started going back and forth about that. But, you know, it was still another, it took 10 solid years, I would say, from the time from about uh, 22 to 32 or 23 to 33, all those years of working really hard without a whole lot happening, except for a few short stories getting published before I got my first short story collection published mm -hmm. um, with Press 53 out of North Carolina. That was my first book. And then that kind of helped with the next step of finding an agent. And I'd already written another novel by that time, Fallen Land. I had Fallen Land already mm -hmm. written. And that agent helped me. I found an agent. He helped me do some revisions. And then we sold it to St. Martin's. And um, and away we went. So, yeah. And you're, are you still with the same agent? Uh, I'm not with the same agent. I actually just recently signed with a new agent, uh, Julie Stevenson of MMQ. I'm really excited. My old agent um, actually, uh, in a kind of an unorthodox fashion, he also worked at uh, the university in Wilmington where uh, I lived and he was a co-agent for an agency in New York. 
And as his career has kind of gone up in the academic world, he really couldn't, you know, keep on agenting. So it was time mm -hmm. to, to make a change. So I actually just recently did that, which was a pretty big uh, step. And I'm really excited about it was nerve wracking for a little while because I'd been with the same agent and I was really comfortable with him, you know, for my entire career. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. But sometimes a little discomfort is good. <laughs> it is. It is. I, I mean, that's what it takes to grow, right? Um, I, t I, I absolutely believe that, you know? And I, I found that sometimes you have to get comfortable with being a little bit uncomfortable, you know, especially in this, uh, in this line of work. You know? <laughs> that's a really good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of unknowns, right? You know, um, I think of it sometimes you know, my sister is more of a, of a business person and, and an entrepreneur, you know, she's done a lot of entrepreneurial things. And, you know, for me, I, I, there are some parallels because it's like, you know, you work on a book, especially fiction, if you don't sell it ahead of time, like nonfiction with an advance. So you work on a book for three, four years, right? And then it's like, here it is. And they can say, it's not what we want or it's not yeah. good enough. And you're like, you know, I mean, it really is like an investment of a lot of time, a lot of heart, you know, a lot of um, just a lot of yourself, uh, right? With, without um, an easy return or, or a guaranteed return at all, right? right. <laughs> you know, um, there, are, there are probably safer ways, you know, <laughs> to go through life uh, uh, in terms of, you know, financial and emotional stability. But uh, again- It's probably not as fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. You know, I tell people, you know, people talk about how time just flies by and people feel like, you know, they're like zombies going through the steps. And I'm like, that's not how my life feels <laughs> at least, you know, um, uh, you know, it feels like you're living, you know. Um, do you life. have a writing, do you have a writing routine, like a specific? Yeah. I'm, speaking um, of the unplanned. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, I'm like really disciplined and strict about it down to a, it's kind of funny almost. So I've done this for a long time. I, I have stuck with uh, Harry Cruz, um, who's a Georgia born writer um, and whom I'm a fan of, especially of what he had to say about writing. He said, you know, his thing was put your ass on the chair. Mm -hmm. And I've also heard it get in the chair. And that's what I have taken as my mantra that all the other things that you could do education wise, inspiration, talent, none of it matters if you don't get in the chair and just do it. And that's the most important thing. And then Faulkner himself said something along the lines of, I only write when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes at 9 a.m. sharp every morning. <laughs> and I always took that to mean, you know, he shows up. If you show up, it'll show up, right? Mm -hmm. So I um, go to the same, I've done this for years. Um, I go to basically the same time of day, the same cafe. I try to sit at the same table for the most part and nothing gets in the way of that kind of writing time. And the way that I do it and have done it for the last few years is kind of strange because um, I do what I call work work during the day. I have a whole separate day job, I call it, which is writing oriented, but it's completely separate. Mm -hmm. And then I take a nap in the afternoon. I get up, I take a shower, I put on a completely different set of clothes. It's like I've started the day all over again. And then I go to my, to my writing spot and I go to work. And that enables me to leave behind all the stress and all the craziness of whatever happened during the day before that, um, that I found really helpful for me to compartmentalize it a little bit mm -hmm. um, and to get in that, just to make sure that that time stays sacrosanct, that it stays protected. Um, and to the degree that in Wilmington, my, my old um, uh, uh, town that I lived in, I used to go right at this cafe bespoke and we're actually doing my first event for wind walkers is going to be at bespoke next Monday. Oh, but um, I had gone away um, on a book trip and I came back. Uh, this was maybe in 2017 or 2018. And I came back to bespoke and I went to go sit. I would sit in the same spot, the same time of day. And they'd put up a plaque <laughs> and it said, um, it's, it's like a little brass plaque, like bars sometimes have. And it says, yeah. um, this spot reserved for Taylor, the bodyguard Brown, GTFU, uh, get the F up. You know? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, <laughs> that kind of told me that, uh, you know, that kind of shows the level of, uh, of, uh, daily discipline I was putting in it, sitting in that spot. Um, <laughs> 
So I haven't earned that anywhere in Savannah yet, but um, just give me time, you know, I'm working <laughs> on it. <laughs> do you, um, do you consider yourself a, a, a plotter or a pantser as they, as they say, do you sort of have a, a story in your head and you do your outline and, and go for it that way? Or you just sort of show up at your discipline time and see what comes out? I am definitely the, the latter. My, uh, every time that I try to outline something I have in the past, it just comes out wooden to me. The, the book or the story comes out just, just wooden. I know too much. I find it much more um, comforting to have an outline, to know what's going to happen. I mean, that knowing what's going to expect, you know, um, does make things, would make things easier, right? Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't come out the same. It doesn't have the same life to it. It doesn't have, uh, it's not the same. So I am very much one of those ones that, that, you know, uh, as EL Dr. Al said, said, it's like driving a car at night. You can get the, the whole way there only if you can only see 500 feet at a time. And that's mm -hmm. how I kind of have thought about it. Um, and another Georgia writer, Peter Ferris just said something that, um, really stuck with me. Uh, he said one thing he has taped on his computer. He has get in the chair taped on his computer, like I said, mm -hmm. and then he has follow the uncertainty taped on the chair or taped on his computer screen. And I really like that too. It's, it's, you're going into that uncertainty. And that to me is where the magic happens because mm -hmm. it is crazy how things come together. When you let your subconscious fly, when you let the story work its way out and the characters work things out on their own. To me, it becomes much more alive. The characters are much more alive if they're not acting according to some, um, to some, you know, if, if they have, it's almost as if we're giving them free will versus mm -hmm. giving them, you know, um, this set destiny, right? Mm -hmm. And that's certainly the way that I would like to think that our lives are. And so, you know, I try to give that to the characters too. Um, not full scale. I mean, I have ideas of where they're going to, where it's going to end up or big things that are going to happen, of course, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the way, but um, I definitely don't have an outline, um, but I do think it would, it would make my life easier. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. How do you, uh, how do you keep it all organized then, you know, when you're sitting down and you're, you're letting it flow and then, um, you know, I'll, I would assume, well, from myself. there's just little files all over my computer. So I don't know. I would like to know how a successful <laughs> person I keeps have, doing this. I have like all, when, like when I get done with the draft, there's like a hundred more pages of notes that I have down under that, that I've put in there of the things that need to happen or things to remember to not mm -hmm. leave out or, you know, certain date, if it's a historical thing, I, we need to know certain dates, certain things happen to keep it straight in my head. Um, so I typically do it largely in the document itself um, mm -hmm. versus having the, um, I do like the idea of having kind of the notes everywhere, like Kent Waskam, mm -hmm. a friend of mine um, uh, who writes awesome novels. He has, you know, all these notes all over on a board and it looks really cool, but I tend to, since I write at the cafe, I just close my computer and have to get on my motorcycle or on my bicycle and go to the cafe and come back. So I can't really have all that. It has to be able to travel with me, right? Mm -hmm. I kind of put it inside the document. Um, that's really the way that, that, I've, um, that I've done it for the most part. Um, usually not, um, I just would be worried. I'm too scattered, I think, to some degree. I can't, I couldn't keep control of like files in different places and written <laughs> stuff. You know what I mean? It's kind of got to yeah. be like right here for me, I guess. Yeah. I, I would say I do a lot too with, um, now one thing that has helped with research books that I'm using, I mm -hmm. can get them, um, in an ebook format and then I can highlight stuff and put notes in there. And that has helped me for going back because it used to be, you know, I would get to the cafe and then I have to get like out of my backpack, like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? Like, here's just a few of my Faulkner books, right? Like, you know, but I got all these other ones. So it'd be like, let me get these out, you know? <laughs> Oh, let me get some of these out and put them up here, you know, and then you're trying to get through it all. And it doesn't, it's kind of tough to, uh, to handle that on a daily basis, you know? So the ebook thing has helped with that a little bit, as much as I love real books for books that, you know, are not research. Um, that's been a big help. Um, how much you mentioned Buenos Aires and San Francisco and different parts of the South. 
how do you see your writing change based on where you are? Do you think like place with the exception of, I know a specific table at the, <laughs> at the cafe, but how do you think that influences uh, what you're writing or what you're working on? I think absolutely has a landscape is really important to me. Um, mm -hmm. And both as a writer and just as a, as a person, you know, I've always found it um, really important to me. I really moved to Western North Carolina to the mountains because I knew I wanted to write Gods of Howell Mountain and I needed to spend more time there and live there to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time I don't write about a place until I'm don't live there anymore. It seems like sometimes mm -hmm. um, maybe that gives me enough distance to feel like I can do it. Um, or maybe that just has to do with you know, writing books takes so long that by the time I've lived somewhere, you know, I moved somewhere, I'm working on something. And by the time that's done, I've already maybe moved somewhere else. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, but now I see myself, I've been playing with something that's set back uh, like on the Cape Fear River around Wilmington, North Carolina, where I moved from. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I wrote Gods of Owl Mountain in Wilmington on the coast after living in uh, the mountains. So I think it has a big influence, but maybe not at the time I'm there necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that part of the reason that we moved to Savannah was, well, one, we just love the city. We love the people here. We love that it is a really creative city, um, but the, the landscape does really speak to me because it is what I grew up closer around, the wetlands, the creeks and the marshes and the, um, the low country, you know, the oaks and the Spanish mm -hmm. moss and, and this almost tropical jungle-like environs at times. Um, th that really found its way into Pride of Eden, my last book, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Wing Walkers travel so much that, you know, there isn't one place that it, it's tied to as much, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What about, we, you, you alluded to your, your day job, your day job, <laughs> air quotes, uh, earlier, and it's, it actually, I mean, as day jobs go, it's a pretty cool day job. Can you talk a little bit about it? We'll admit, yeah. <laughs> so um, I started and am the editor in chief of bikebound.com, which is a, a custom motorcycle website. We feature bikes, uh, custom bikes from all over the world, like cafe racers, scramblers, street trackers, uh, vintage bikes, race bikes. And, you know, I grew up around motorcycles. My dad was really into them. Um, you can see this influence from my dad and a lot of, you know, the aviation with wing walkers and motorcycles. Um, and I had done a lot of work, you know, my day job work up until then had been largely for other companies doing online stuff that I didn't really care for, but knew how to do. It was something that you could a lot of the time um, do remotely, which did help with the writing. You know, if I didn't have to be, you know, in an office all day, it helped me to have the flexibility um, to do a little more traveling and writing. Um, and at some point I decided, let me try to take some of those skills and put them toward something that, um, that I really care about, that I have passion about. And so I started bike bound and, uh, I think I started in 2014 and my dad had just retired. And so he also was kind of looking for stuff to do. So what he was able to do is go to a lot of the motorcycle shows and events and talk to people, interview them, send pictures back. He liked to call himself our senior correspondent. <laughs> and it was great because then he also had an excuse with my mom because he was helping me to go, you know, to get all this stuff. and it was tax deductible. Um, and uh, in 2017, he uh, was killed in a motorcycle accident. And oh, I really had to decide, I doubled down on bike bound after that because it became a legacy thing to some degree although I had started it he hadn't started it we worked on it it was really something that we had worked on together mm -hmm. um and uh so I really redouble my focus on it um and it has really been such an amazing thing it's now I believe the second largest custom motorcycle site in the world it's been the largest in the United <sighs> States for a long time we have um almost 700,000 followers on Facebook uh, almost 250,000 on Instagram. Um, it has just gotten, it's really, you know, gotten huge. And it, again, that largely came from that dedicated discipline of, you know, there was a time when we had to get, I remember getting a thousand followers on Instagram was a big deal. Right. Mm -hmm. 
and it just had doing it day in and day out and believing that one day it would pay off, you know, and it did. But I mean, there were years that it wasn't making any money or anything. And it wasn't, it was just a project that I was doing on top of the writing and on top of my other regular work just to, to keep it going. Right. Um, but it has turned into the most awesome thing because nowhere else have I quite found this kind of awesome, symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship because we feature bikes from all over the world, largely from smaller workshops, you know, I mean, from, from the United States, of course, but, you know, um, Argentina, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, Turkey, Czech Republic, you know, I mean, uh, all over Europe, everywhere. And the folks who build the bikes are so excited to get the exposure on a huge platform. For me, it's great because they basically come to me with a story about every bike that you build has a story behind it, why it looks the way it does, what they or the client wanted, what the use is for it, what they were inspired by. And a lot of times there's beautiful stories behind them because it's built in tribute to someone's parents or it's built based on a childhood memory. This was the bike I wanted when I was, you know, 16 years old and now I'm 65 and I can build it. Or this is the bike I wanted to ride across Sardinia with, right? I mean, all that kind of thing. And then, and lots of, and they usually have really good photos of it. So they come to me with an awesome story and, you know, then I get to help and, you know, showcase that bike to the, the, a really big community, you know, largely the, the custom motorcycle community, you know, follows a few different websites that are kind of like this, right? You know, there's probably five really big ones that are out there and really top three ones. I think, you know, bike bound pipe burn and bike XF are probably the, the, the three big ones, biggest ones now. And, um, so everyone in the world gets to see it. And then, you know, people get inspired from bikes that are, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away across on the other side of the world. It's pretty neat the way it all has worked out. You know, it's the, one of the ways in which kind of social media and the internet has brought people closer together. And like, you know, we went to Portugal in 2018 and we featured a number of bikes from Portuguese builders. So we had friends there, you know, I mean, I'd only met them before on, you know, cause we feature their bikes. You go back and forth with them a lot. You feel like you already know them and then you go there and you do, you know? So, um, it was, a, it was really, it, that's a really neat thing. And also what a great, what a great day job. <laughs> yeah, or a worse day for, job. Um, okay. for, for an author, you know, because you're getting all of these stories, not only showcasing them on Bikebound, but also, mm-hmm. I mean, what great material, right, mm-hmm. to have to, to work with in, in fiction. Um, what are you reading right now? And what's your favorite thing you've read recently? Um, the most fascinating, I'll tell you about this fascinating book that I just read called um, Breath by, I believe his name is James Nestor. I found this book absolutely fascinating. I found it on accident. A friend of mine, Peter McGuire, wrote uh, a book called Breathe, which is about Hicks and Gracie who brought you know Brazilian jiu-jitsu to the United States. And it's about the Gracie family and all that, which is an awesome book in and of itself for anyone who's interested in that. But when I was looking for breathe to to get it, I came across breath and um, it's about the science, the lost kind of science and art of breathing. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. It is about all ties together, basically what you learn from a lot of more ancient cultures and, you know, going back to the origins of uh, yoga and, you know, Buddhist meditative breathing and all this with scientific evidence for why things like make like breathing out of your nose instead of your mouth and all these things are really good for your health Mm -hmm. and it was just full of one thing after another that was just like wow that is so interesting for instance uh one thing that stuck with me was they recently did a study and they um hook up you know breathing apparatuses to people who were doing uh one of the um uh kind of major Buddhist um, uh, praying ma- mantras. Mm-hmm. And then, and also to people who are doing the, um, the, the rosary uh, mm-hmm. in the original Latin. And they have already found that five breaths in and five breaths out a minute, um, which is about five and a half, 
liters of air in and out is really ideal for getting yourself into a good calm state. Mm -hmm. Um, and we spend so much time, you know, like hyperventilating almost because we're stressed (laughs) and all this, if they found that both of those, uh, doing those prayers, it just in the way that the syllables work and how many syllables there are and stuff typically make people breathe in and out five times a minute. And they actually oh. think that those prayers may have evolved over hundreds of years for that reason. So that literally doing those prayers is healing for you. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of fascinating. All this stuff that like, is fascinating. You know, it's all these Stanford studies and all this stuff, you know? Um, uh, so anyways, I found that really, really, um, really, really interesting. I just picked up um, a book yesterday that I've already gotten into by a Western uh, writer. I think he's out of Texas, James Wade, uh, called, it's called River Sing Out, I believe. Let me just make sure I got that, um, the title right. Um, Yes. And I just started it yesterday and I've been really, really into it. It's kind of like East Texas bayous. It's got this thriller and crime element, but also this kind of Cormac McCarthy builds a lot of philosophy into it at the same time that um, I'm kind of a sucker for that kind of thing. So um, I'm really enjoying that. And um, honestly, besides, I, I've been reading so much nonfiction stuff for what I'm working on that, that there has been a lot of, um, of that that I've been reading lately. That, and I've just gotten into reading a bunch of um, Zen stuff, basically about Zen that this Breathe book got me interested in. Yeah. Well, that sounds very cool. (laughs) Um, what do you know now that you wish you'd known before publishing your first novel? It's a good question. Um, a few different things. Um, I have learned that there have been a number of times when it felt like I was against the wall in terms of, I didn't have, you know, things didn't work out the way that I thought And I thought it was a wall. And usually when you feel like you're at that wall, you're not, you just think that you are. There's something else that you can do. You can get around that wall or go under that wall or go over that wall or wait a little while. There's something that you can do. So it's not, um, you don't need to panic, you know, because there are times when it feels like maybe I should panic, you know, or I am panicking. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that uh, is something to keep in mind that helps you know, just from a, um, a standpoint of, 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 you know, when you get some rejection and it feels like the end somehow, it's not the end. And it's not the worst thing that there are, there other, other things work themselves out, you know? Um, I think that, I think that I'm lucky that I didn't burn out the way that I was going for a long time, because there was a, a, a a significant period of time that I, um, you know, the first few books came out really fast and I still would say I'm kind of a workhorse with, obviously I go every day and I I work really hard at it, but I didn't have balance in my life. I think for a while, um, Mm -hmm. I just went at it with this very, almost kind of like monk like focus where, I mean, writing was everything to me. There really wasn't anything else in my life. I didn't have relationship. Um, you know, I had a few friends, but I didn't have, um, you know, uh, any real romantic relationships. I didn't have a whole lot else in my life, but work. Right. And I, part of that appeals to me. I mean, there is some part of me that has this, that's very mission oriented and very focused, but, um, I have learned to have more balance and to be a little bit more like the tortoise than the hare. Um, I still like to be like the hare when I'm writing my, you know, when I'm really writing, I feel really into it. Right. And I try, you know, I'm, I'm, put everything I can into it when I'm doing it. But when I'm not actually doing the writing itself, I've learned to take a little bit of a step back and have more balance in my life and not to go like that about everything else. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Have these other things in my life that can fill my well besides just the writing. Mm -hmm. Um, And it helped being in, you know, a really awesome committed relationship with uh, my partner, Addie Jo has really helped with that. Um, we have like three dogs now. So I have significant other responsibilities, you know, <laughs> them and just, you know, as bike mounds grown, I have more with that, but mm-hmm. just having more things in my life outside of writing, I think has 
enabled me to enjoy writing will enable me to keep doing it for longer and enjoy it more because there was a time I never got burned out, but there was a time where I could see myself starting to go in that direction, you know? Um, and that would be really hard for me because I would lose the thing that, that, you know, I love so much. That's such a deep part of me, you know? Yeah. I think you do have to be careful with, I mean, it's with anything, you know, you see it in sports all the time with folks that yeah. train from the time they're, they're a kid at something and then they kind of achieve something and then they're burned out and they don't even like it anymore, you know, yeah. and that can be a really sad, tough thing because so much of their life has been invested into it and then they kind of lose it. Right. Um, and they usually come back around to it, you know, but mm -hmm. We just watched this Tony Hawk documentary, which was fascinating. It's a new HBO documentary they did on him. And, you know, that really happened to Tony Hawk at some time. And he had to, um, I mean, he was almost in a catatonic no. state for a little while, it said, you know, I mean, wow. he, he had, he had, you know, he wasn't having fun skateboarding anymore, you know, and he had to really find a new way to come back to it and enjoy it. Um, and that kind of just hit it home, hit home on that idea too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think artistic creative endeavors can be the same thing. They can feed us so much, but we have to be careful not to just rely just on that, right? Um, yeah. To be everything to us, um, especially when you know publishers and critical reviews and all that stuff. You know, if you if that's all you're dependent on, and then you got, you're dealing with you know that that makes it tough enough already, right? <laughs> not being able to step away from it a little bit, you know, is a can put you in a little bit of a better relationship with it I think sometimes that's really that's a great point and really really great advice um so I see that we're coming sort of sort of to the end of our I don't want to keep you all afternoon although I could because you're so interesting to talk to but I'll I'll um I'll I'll skip to our our usual last question which is uh if or when when your book is made into a a movie or TV series, what would you pick for the theme song? Oh, the theme song. Oh, <laughs> this is good. Oh. Okay, for when I was just thinking about this because someone asked me who I would have play the character. So I was okay. just thinking along <laughs> these lines. Um, uh, for the theme song, I, I think something along the lines of, I don't know. I, to me, I love, um, I really love Terrence Malick um, mm -hmm. movies and they a lot of the time have a somewhat similar kind of theme song to them. Um, like a, I think Badlands and Days of Heaven and a lot of those have this kind of, um, oh gosh, but I don't know how to describe it exactly because I'm so not musically um, informed in some ways, you know. <laughs> um, but I think something along those lines or something with a little bit of, uh, you know, I'm a big bluegrass fan and I think there's a little bit of that element in a lot of my um, work, you know, banjos, kind of mountain music, old ballads and that kind of thing. Um, something along those la lines, I think. But I don't have like a specific song necessarily that's like, this would be the song for Wing Walkers. I'd have to think about that a little bit, um, a little bit more. Well, if we make a make a playlist from the podcast, I'll get back to you and let you give us a specific specific yeah. one. <laughs> I love the whole book podcast thing. I always think those are um, those are fun, you know, and digging up some of the the songs. Sometimes, you know, I really listen to certain songs when I'm working on something because I want to get some element of that into it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, although I think I did that a little bit less for Wing Walkers, Gods of Howl Mountain. I did that a lot. There was a lot uh, in Fallen Land because they both had this kind of mu mountain music element to them. So I was listening to a lot of that while it was while it was going on. Yeah. Taylor, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. It was really a pleasure talking to you and learning all about your process and about your latest book. Congratulations again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun really was fun. Thanks again, Taylor. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for joining us on Literary Prospects. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'll see you next time.